Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the meeting we're having this Friday and tomorrow. We praise your name because you brought us together and we know that a lot can be done to the glory of your name. We're praying that as we come before you, <clears throat> you help us to be sincere and open before you. Amen. And you show us, Lord, your mind concerning ourselves, concerning our lives, and concerning your expectations in our lives. Amen. Oh Lord, we're looking up to you that you'll speak to every one of our hearts. Amen. And none will be so deaf, none will be so blind, that you cannot see, that you cannot hear what you are saying and what you are showing us today. Amen. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will help us to be what we ought to be. Amen. Touch our very nature. Touch our hearts and spirits. Amen. Touch our attitudes as well. Amen. Help us that we will not be reprobates and cast away before your sight, Amen. but that will belong to you since you have saved us. Amen. Father, we pray that anything that will bring separation between us and you, you will cast everything away from us in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, keep standing as we sing, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, unto thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise.
Let's all be seated. From Proverbs chapter 27, verse 23. We have stated there one of the purposes and one of the reasons why we are gathered here tonight and why we are having the meetings we are having tonight and tomorrow morning. It says there, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. Here the Spirit of the Lord himself is telling us that we should not take things for granted when we have become shepherds or shepherdesses. As we have been given a responsibility over the flock of Christ and over the herds of sheep, flock of sheep, that Christ himself purchased with his own blood, we should once in a while, from time to time, look diligently so that we'll know the state of the flock and so that we'll be able to diligently see the needs of the flocks of the Lord under our leadership. And so in obedience to the calling of the Spirit of God, we want to see over this weekend where the church is and what the church is doing. And in particular, your own area of the work. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flock and look well to thy herds. We'll need to be very diligent and we'll need to really examine ourselves and evaluate the work that we're doing. That evaluation is so necessary. And here is what the Lord himself is calling us to. That we will know, we'll look, we'll see. Jesus Christ, before he left, look at the state of the disciples. And he told the Father how he felt from what he saw in John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Verse 4. He said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He evaluated the work that the Father had given him to do. And he said he had finished that work. And he had glorified the Lord all through his earthly ministry. We should not allow the devil to deceive us that we have always glorified the Lord. Neither should we take for granted that whatever we have done, whatever we have said, in whichever way we have acted, we have always glorified the Lord. There is necessity for evaluation and for re-examination. But in the case of Jesus Christ, after allowing the Spirit to examine and to look at everything he had done, he said he had glorified the Lord on the earth. And we know that that is true because the testimony of Scripture bears that out. In Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 7, verse 37, and were astonished and were beyond measure astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. The people that spoke at this time spoke in particular about the ministry of healing in the Lord Jesus Christ when he said he had done all things well. He has healed the sick. Even those who are incurably sick, Jesus Christ had healed them. But we are students of the Bible. We know that it goes beyond just the healing. When the testimony of scripture says 
He has done all things well. We could ask if we had the opportunity, Mary, that lived with Jesus for the major part of his earthly life. And I believe that Mary will have just this single thing to say. He has done all things well. And I think we can ask his own disciples as well, those who lived with him while he was undergoing the very heat of opposition among the children of Israel. And they saw his attitude, they saw his response, they saw every step that he took. And I think if we ask his disciples, they will say the same thing. He has done all things well. Even his accusers, we could ask them. He himself pointed at them one time, and he said, which of you convinces me of sin? We could ask his um, enemies that were watching for his faults, watching for his downfall, and they wanted to pick holes if they could find any. They wanted to show that he wasn't actually right if they could find a flaw in his life. And I think that those people, they would say, he has done all things well. You remember after he died, when they saw Peter and John, they took knowledge of, of them. They had been with Jesus Christ. And of the people that lived many years after Jesus Christ, even those who are not Christians, they have looked at the records of the life of Jesus Napoleon had a chance of commenting on the life of Jesus Christ. And Mahatma Gandhi had a chance of commenting on the life of Jesus Christ. And all that these people could say is that without shooting gun, without carrying the sword, without holding anything beyond a whip, just one time, he did all things well. That is was authority through love. His was the caring of a shepherd. And his was the nursing of a mother and a father. He has done all things well. As you look at the life of Jesus Christ all over again, and you follow him from the cradle right to the grave, you will see that even though he had a background talking humanly and talking about his earthly heritage, a background of poverty, a background of the lack of education, yet set within or set against that background of poverty and lack of education, he did all things well. Not only that, his birth was unexplainable to the people around him. And many times around him, they ridicule and they'll jest. And they will say, we are not born of fornication. Because Mary could not fully explain to those unbelievers, they were not willing to accept the miracle that took place at his birth. Even though he had that stigma all around him and the rejection of the people around him. You know, when you are rejected, when you are not accepted, when even from your birth, it appears that something happens. Something happened that were not totally acceptable to the people of your community. And you have to fight against that type of stigma. You see how it makes you nervous. And even the things you could have done well, you couldn't do them well. But Jesus Christ, even against that background, he did all things well. In the midst of his own disciples that were not totally faithful. In the midst of disciples that were not matured. That were not perfect by any measurement. Even by their own measurement. They lacked faith. They lacked maturity. They lacked wisdom, and they lacked foresight. They lacked vision. Many times they didn't understand Christ, even in the midst of those disciples that will misunderstand him. And one of them will say, you will not go to the cross. Even in the midst of the people that he will say, you do not understand the things belonging to God, but you are talking of things belonging to man. Get thee behind me, Satan. In the midst of those unruly people, he did all things well. He had to live with a Judas Iscariot that from the beginning had even been stealing from the bag. Not only that, he had it in mind to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord knew because he knew all things. 
And he knew from the very beginning who should betray him. Living with a betrayer in the ship, on the seashore, in the house, eating on the same, at the same plate with somebody that was going to betray him. And every time that he saw Judas Iscariot, he could see that mob following after Judas Iscariot coming to take him. And he could see the clubs in their hand prophetically. And he could see as a prophet of God and as the very son of God, he could see everything that will happen through Judas Iscariot. How do you behave when you know that somebody is around, is always trailing your steps, who is going to betray you, who is going to lie against you, who is going to make people crucify you, who is, make, who is going to make people kill you, and you know it very well. How do you behave? You behave in such a way that before he gets at you, let me get at him. But even living with such a Judas Iscariot, he did all things well. All the time, there were officers in his meeting. These officers were there to take a word from him and then use it to wrap a rope around his neck and hang him. And he knew that all the time the people were there. And yet all the things they had to teach from the father, there were things that will not be acceptable to these people. And they were watching him, just that they'll catch him at a word. The Pharisees, they looked for an opportunity. The Sadducees looked for an opportunity. Sometimes the audience were sent. Sometimes the officers were sent. And in the midst of the people that were watching for his fall, to catch a word out of his mouth, he did all things well. Even in the last week, the most trying week of his life, even at that time when he knew that the cross was very near, that crucifixion was very near, the testimony still is, at that trying hour, in the heat of the battle, he did all things well. As I talk to you, I think about myself, that I cannot say I've done all things well. Since I was born, well, you understand, all I've seen and come short of the glory of God. But even if I limit myself to the point I've been born, since I've been born again, as I look back, I cannot say I've done all things well. Well, you might even say, every Christian has his own immaturity and imperfection since I became baptized in the Holy Ghost. I cannot say I've done all things well. Well, you might say we're all growing. I cannot say that even since the beginning of this year, I've done all things well. I don't know about you. And this is why we have come together to re-examine, to evaluate what we're doing. So that we'll be able to look up to the Lord before the judgment day and say, Lord, you said you finished the work. You did everything that the Father told you to do. And the testimony of scripture about you is that you have done all things well. Even on the stormy sea, you did all things well. Confronted by people that had demonic spirits, you did all things well. Even when you were tired and worn out, and it appeared that you needed rest and you needed food, you needed some privacy. All the time, you still did all things well. Lord, I have a long way to go. And so Jesus said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And then he told the Father, in verse 10. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. I kept them in thy name. Of course, he knew the father will want to find out when he got to the father eventually. How have you done it? Have you kept those people? Have you looked well to thy hurts? Have you diligently taken time to know the state of thy flocks? And so he examined and he evaluated, and he said, Lord, I'm coming home. It will just be a few days now, then the crucifixion will take place, and I will see you. And as I think of going and coming to you, I look, that, I look at these people, and I have kept them. 
And so you need to evaluate what you, are, what you have been doing. So one of the reasons why we're here this weekend is that each one will be able to evaluate. Each one will be able to examine the thing that the Father has placed in your hand, how you have done it, or how you have not done it. Not only that, we'll be able to plan in Luke chapter 14, from verse 28, for which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? It was Jesus Christ here that told his own disciples, and he told them that if they were going to build a tower, they would need to count the cost. Sit down first. There is a time of sitting down to evaluate, to plan. Then there is a time of moving out to act and do the work. And Jesus said that his own disciples must not be people that seem confused, as if they do not know what they ought to do. We should sit down first and we should plan. We should count the cost and see whether we have sufficient resources in manpower and material things and also in abilities and gifts and talents, whether we have resources to finish the work that we have to do. And so we have come together this uh, weekend also so we can plan and look ahead. First of all, we evaluate. We see where we are spiritually. We see where we are on the work of the Lord. And then we look ahead and we plan. As we look ahead and plan and as we see what has been happening in the past, we'll discover that we'll need more grace so that we can do the things he wants us to do effectively. And so we've come together this weekend too so that we can seek the face of the Lord for more grace. We need to pray more. The less we pray, the more mistakes we make. And if you look at your lives and look at the work that God has committed into your hand, I think that if you'll be sincere, every one of you will confess, at least to God, that you have prayed less this period, this year, than you have done before. And the less you have prayed, the more mistakes you have made. The less we pray, the more impatient we become with people. And as you have seen the activities and the various things that you have to do, and you have seen that you have not taken everything to the Lord in prayer, as we're told and taught in that song, what a friend we have in Jesus. You have seen that the less you have prayed, the more impatient you have become. And because we have been prayerless, we have also seen that more and more we have deviated from the very life of Christ. And we are coming far, far and far apart from the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But over here this weekend, as we look at the word of God, as we evaluate all that we've been doing, and as we plan, we seek grace from the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 40, from verse 30 to 31, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. The youths, the young people, shall fail and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you will look inwards a moment and look back a moment 
and see how you have been tensed up, how you have worked under pressure, until there is no rest within your spirit. And it is not a matter of just the activities. It's not just a matter of the much work that you have to do. It's a matter of attitude. It's a matter of being prayerless. It's a matter of doing something that could be done in the spirit in five minutes, trying to do it in the energy of the flesh. Something that could have been done in an hour if we are prayerful, if we are asking the Lord, and we could have done it in the wisdom of God, how we have labored to the point that we're tired for one whole week, and we do not receive any wisdom from God, any help from the Lord, to the point that we're almost feeling we cannot do the work again. And when you come to that stage, you understand you've been doing it in the energy of the flesh. Because as yet, you have not done as much as Jesus. And it's easy when there is oil that lubricates the machine. But if the machine will go on without any lubrication, without any oil of the Holy Spirit, it makes a lot of noise, it generates a lot of heat, and it breaks down faster, and then drags so much that the work is not done. And if you will look at your very lives and the activities that you have been doing, you will discover that because of the energy of the flesh, we've made so much noise, we've created so much heat, we've raised so much dust, and we ourselves are tired to the point we are saying, Lord, either you come or you get me out of this business of winning souls. It's always difficult to do spiritual work with physical energy. Always difficult. But we've come together this weekend so that we'll be able to renew our strength and then mount up with wings as eagles. In man, there is not the natural ability to operate above the ground. In man, there is not the natural ability without aid to operate above the ground. Our nature is earthly, and all we can do will be done with the dust of the earth. And eventually, when we're finished here, dust art thou, and to dust shalt thou return. But it is only as we seek the face of our Heavenly Father that that thing that heaven has a monopoly of will come into us, will lift, up, will lift us up above the ground, and then with wings we mount up as eagles. And the more intimate you are with the Lord, the closer you are to heaven, the higher you can fly, the greater you can do. But the more you are involved with your own nature, with your own ability, with your own human attainment, and with things that are just earthly abilities, the more you keep to the ground, the more intimate you are with things that are lowly, and the more difficult it is to do the work that only can be done in the energy of the Spirit of God. We need to really pray and seek the face of the Lord, knowing that in ourselves we have come to the end of our ability. And we have been asking ourselves, what more can I do? Where else can I go? What other resources can I use? How best can I do the work? I've done the best I know how. There's no progress. I've done the best I know how, and yet it appears everybody is worn out. I've worked myself ragged, and I've worked other people tired. So where can we go from here? When we do not know how to move forward, then we can move up and pray and seek the face of the Lord. The youth shall fade and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And the more you have to do, 
the more you'll have to pray. Otherwise, you'll depend on your own wisdom. You'll depend on earthly methods, and you will fail. Everyone before you that has ever depended on human wisdom has always failed. So there will be no exception, whoever you are. If you depend on human wisdom, human resources, earthly abilities, and natural talents, you'll fail. But then, if you wait upon the Lord, and you'll say, Lord, I know that I cannot make it by myself alone. You renew your strength. Then you'll mount up. You'll run and not be weary. Run and not be weary. And how many people can sincerely say that in the depths of their hearts, in the secrets of their hearts, they have not been weary? Not only outwardly, not only being fatigued in the head, but confused in the mind. Tired, passing out, almost saying, like Moses of old, Lord, did I bear these people? Can I bear their burden alone by myself? Can I move forward? If you deal with me thus, then kill me because I'm not fit to live. Let me get out the whole of the whole, let me get out of the whole of this mess. Many people have felt like that. And you feel like that when you depend upon your natural talents. Natural talents will fail you. It has to. Otherwise, you will not need Christ. If natural talents alone will make it, why do we need to depend on Christ? Without me, ye can do nothing. Many times we don't believe that until we fall back right on our face. And we know that really, without him, we can do nothing. We have come together this weekend so that one, we evaluate, two, we plan, three, we seek more grace from the Lord, four, that we can give you some necessary information on the restructuring that we're doing. If you look at the program page, you'll see that we have restructured the districts and the zones. And um, now we have nine districts and the zones under each of the districts are written there. And um, because we have nine districts, we also have the district coordinators that will be in charge of those districts. And now, Agege zone, Agege district rather, uh, that's on page three. Agege district, as uh, the coordinator, Brother Akinwande. Ajegule district, the coordinator is uh, now Brother Ibeawochi. Alimosho district, the coordinator is uh, Brother Nadoze. Festac district, you'll see we've changed the name. Festac district is now Brother Jeremiah Okpara. Bagada district is uh, Brother Oshinaike. Ketu district is Brother Dele Adeyemo. Lagos Island district is Brother Bangboye. Mushi district is Brother Oluwi, and Suruleri district is Brother Akonde. So we have um, made all these restructuring. And the reason we have made the restructuring is that we'll be able to monitor very properly the growth of each district. And as I said last Saturday, our restructuring will eventually lead us to bring districts into Sunday services. That is, a particular district totally will be in one particular uh, Sunday service. Then we'll be able to monitor the growth effectively and properly. 
At present, we're still having our Sunday worship and the other services the way we're having them, even though we have all this restructure. When the final thing comes out on which district to be in which service, we'll be informing the workers and informing the uh, members of the church as well. All the area leaders in Ajegunle district, that's under Brother Ibiawuchi now as a district, all the zonal leaders, the women representatives, and uh, the zonal leaders, area leaders, women representatives, will meet with me here next Friday. And um, you'll be with me here from about 6 o'clock. And I want you to be very, very punctual. Uh, I need to see you as a district together uh, to share more with you on just your district alone, apart from the meeting we're having now, which is a general thing for all the districts and all the area leaders. Please don't forget, I plan to sleep here. We'll be here uh, Friday night through Saturday morning. All of the area leaders, zonal leaders, IFR representatives and um, the school outreach representatives and the area leaders uh, for the Ajegunle district. You listen more to uh, our new coordinator there, uh, so he'll tell you more as to how to be, uh, who are qualified to come here. There may be people who are not here now who should be here at that time. Six o'clock uh, next Friday, please, let's be here together. Now, we've looked at the purpose to tell you that we make all these reorganizations and restructuring. You've now got the information. Now, what preparations do we need to make? So that the work that is committed into our hands now will meet the well done of the Lord. Each one of us will need to examine our lives in the area of our Christ likeness. Christ likeness. I don't know about you, but what I discovered in my own personal life is that when I didn't have a lot to do, a lot to preach, a lot of places to go, I was much more like Christ because I had all the time to read the Bible, all the time to pray, all the time. When I read the Bible, I wasn't looking for messages for other people. I was looking for message just for myself. When I went to church and I listened to other people preaching, I didn't write notes to say that that's a good material to teach other people. I said that's something good for me. And every time that the preacher finished preaching, I saw the areas that I wasn't as Christ in all, like Christ in all, that made me pray. And I saw that at that time, much of the prayers I prayed would be, Lord, I want to fit into your will. I want to fit into your plan. I want to be like Christ. I want to be who you want me to be. I don't know about you, but as I look at my past life, I saw that those years when there was no preaching, many, many years ago, my heart was very tender. My heart was very sensitive. And if I listened to a message of the word of God and I found that somebody had offended me, I would immediately go to that individual and say, Jesus said, when you are offended, this is what we should do. And if I've offended somebody, because I wasn't preaching and I wasn't looking for uh, something I would preach at other people, counsel other people with, talk to other people about, I discovered that every time I listened, if I'd offended somebody, first of all, I'd go before the Lord. And as I go before the Lord, I'll say, Lord, you know this, what I've done. And then immediately I rise up. I go to the person that I offended. I had nothing to lose. I wasn't a preacher. I wasn't a leader. And the person wasn't going to say, I look at a leader confessing all this. I confessed everything I needed to confess because there was nothing to lose. I was just a member of the body of Christ. And the word of God came to me. Every time I heard about the second coming of the Lord, I said, Lord, you may come today. I wasn't setting goals and making plans and saying the church should be up to 2,000, the church should be up to 3,000. 
All that I wanted, all that I knew about the church was my heart. The planning was done by other people. All I was planning about is, Lord, I want to make rapture. All I was planning about is, Lord, I want to see your face on the last day. But you know that as I, you know, I've become involved in the work of the Lord, part of that time I used to think about, Lord, I want to make the rapture. Lord, I want my heart to be like your heart. Lord, I want my life to be like your life. Part of that time now, I diverge into, Lord, the church should grow. And sometimes, unfortunately, I forget myself that in looking for growth, I become a little bit hard as I will not be hard before. Because in the past, I'll think about the rapture, I'll not be hard. Because I'll think about the rapture in the past, and because I'll think about what will Jesus say, what will Jesus do, I'll be very, very tender like a little child. But I don't know about you, that's my experience. That the more you get involved in the work of the Lord, if you are not very careful, the less Christ-like you become. That before you start working, now you area leaders, this is a warning to you. We who have been running the race before you as pastor, as coordinator, as zona leader, as old area leaders, we are warning you. We are telling you that before we started the work, before we became very much involved, before we became, uh, you know, very enthusiastic about church growth and about success and about this and that, we are very, very Christ-like, very, very prayerful, very, very humble, very, very devoted and very, very loving. Very, very loving. You know, before I became um, a worker, a preacher, I'd be afraid to talk to anybody with a harsh tone. Very, very afraid. Because I remember the scripture every time that if you get angry with your brother and you say, thou fool, you are in danger of hellfire. I remember that every week. And anytime anybody is talking to me, I'll be saying, Lord, Help me not to be angry. Help me not to lose my sanctification. But you know, it's unfortunate as I started working for God and I wanted the people to be effective. I wanted them to do the work. And if I was, you know, very soft and it was uh, going on, you know, gently and all that, they will not do the work. You know, I just forgot myself. And I'll just say, you don't do that, you're in trouble. And I'll be hard. And before I realized that I was losing the nature of Christ, I'd gone very far. Very, very far. That, and you'll say, you'll say, but were you not reading the Bible? Oh, yes, I was reading the Bible. But you know, I wasn't reading the Bible for myself alone anymore. I was reading the Bible for the people, just to preach to them, just to talk to them. And to talk to them that this is what you should do, this is what you should do. But... Eventually, I said, Lord, look at what's happening. I was better than this when I wasn't preaching. I think a preacher should be better than the people. But this is the reverse now. And if you look at your life, my brother, my sister, you may have discovered that as you became leaders and workers, coordinators, that now you feel, you know, if I don't do this and lose my soul and get angry and get hard and get boisterous and hammer the people on the head, hammer them on the chest, break their bones, they will not do the work. If I'm not hard on them, if I don't get angry, if I don't behave like Moses and tell them right to their face, you stiff-necked people, will I bring water out of the rock for you? If I don't tell them that they will not know their carnality, and because of that now we are less Christ-like. And you know why we are choosing to become coordinators? The people saw that we are Christ-like so gentle and so loving and caring for the people and they'll say, that man he behaves like a woman will encourage you like a woman, if you had any problem will weep like a baby that man is so soft, if we need a coordinator, we need that man that's why they chose us as coordinators, but now we want the work to be successful want the zones to grow want all the districts to grow and because of running after growth we ran away from Christ. We're hard on the people. And the people right now, they're saying, Lord, when will you come? They're fed up. And they're saying, which church shall we go again? They say, when we came to this church, it was different. They cared for us. 
they helped us, they prayed for us. And even these coordinators and zonal leaders, that time they didn't have money. We know everybody. But even though they didn't have money, oh, they took care of us. And they will say, I can remember so-and-so's wife, when I had a problem, will come and sleep in my house. Let's go. That even this coordinator at that time was just ordinary area leader. At that time, oh, I remember that brother, he was totally different. Maybe we should fast for him, that God will help him to go back to what he was. Now his coordinator is not like he was before. Maybe the church has seen God this man in making him a coordinator. Because when he was just ordinary member of the church, I know this man. I know this man. He'll, he'll give anything. He'll do anything. He'll go any length. And I never saw him get angry before. But now he's coordinator. Every time I see him, it appears that he's carrying the whole district on his head. And because of the weight and the load on the district, he gets angry every time. And we see it. And we know it. That the more the work, the less Christ-like we have become. Now we are kings, we oppress the people. The same thing with zonal leaders. When the zone was just about 300, we loved the people. When you just became a zonal leader, you know, like Saul, you said, do the people said, those people that say Saul will not be king, bring them here. Let us kill them. And Saul said, no, you will not kill anybody, not for me. We must be gentle towards everybody. Even those people that said I will not be king, leave them all alone. But now eventually, after you become zonal leader for a time, even though you were gentle before, and anybody that said, no, we don't accept him as zonal leader, we don't accept him as zonal leader, well, you just said, uh, maybe because of my foolishness some years ago, maybe they are right. And I'm not even qualified to be a zonal leader. I think they are right. And then you went to them, you said, my brother, my sister, I understand you. That you are saying, you don't accept me as zonal leader. Can I tell you the truth? I don't even accept myself as zonal leader. I think you are right. But you see, the church put me there. And what will I do now? If I say I will not do it, I fear that will be disobedience. Why not pray for me? And those people that said they don't accept you as zonal leader, they said, ah, look at this man. He said that he's not even qualified. We thought he will hate us. We thought that he would talk against us and do this and that. They started praying for you. It is their prayer that made your zone to grow to 1,000. Not your ability. What do you know? What do you have? What can you do? Don't we know you? Are we not together? Don't we know ourselves? What ability do you have to make a zone go from 300 to 1,000? Is the prayers of the people. Is their support. But now they are 1,000. And you feel like a king. And now you are chasing after David. And David is not your problem. David is just a house fellowship leader. And anytime he has opportunity, he can help you kill Goliath. And put his life in danger. Why are you chasing after David? And you are telling Jonathan, Jonathan, you are the son of a foolish woman. Don't you know? As long as that David is there, you will not reign. Let's leave that in the hands of God. Why are we persecuting our fellow brothers and sisters in the body of Christ? Where do we want to drive them to? David said, So, what have I done? You have driven me away this day from the house of God. What have I done? Allow me to be in Israel and worship God. Now I live in caves. Now I live in dens. What have I done? And Saul said, is that your voice, my son? Oh, yes, it's my voice. If I've done anything wrong, tell me. Let me make restitution. King, you left your throne. And here you are in the wilderness chasing after me. What have I done? And I'm the one that played the instrument for the evil spirit to leave you. I'm the one that killed Goliath. When everybody was shaking, zonal leaders, what have these people done? You see, because of activity, because we've been too busy doing this and doing that, those activities have blinded us. And I will tell the people in those zones, now the church is large, Anything I do, I do it. 
You want to see pastor? How will you see pastor? Is pastor going to wait for you like they used to do at uh, Flat 2 or they used to do at IBTC and sit down there and say, anybody that wants to see me, if you are not careful, I will send you out of the church. But to see pastor, you cannot see pastor. You want to see him, go ahead and see him. And we know that you cannot see pastor. He's a slave. And if he doesn't accept his slavery wholeheartedly and gently, he will die in slavery. If he's sick, nobody will look at him. Once a uh, zonal leader, you tell all those area leaders and ask for that so and so is a criminal, don't go there. They will not go there. If they go there, you stop them. You discipline them. Now, a lot of people are in exile. They are under discipline. I don't even know how many are under discipline now. We have oppressed the people. Some people just, they just pack quietly out, leave the church, and they say, God, that's my church, but they are driven me out. And they say, this house fellowship system is a curse on the church. It has helped some people, but it is ruining many people. And it is because zonal leaders were no more like Christ. We're no more as gentle. Now we get angry. Now we're oppressive on the people. And we tell them there's nothing they can do. And then, on Sunday, we are the people that will teach them such the scripture. The people are unfortunate. When will Christ come to deliver them? From the oppression and from the bondage. You new area leaders, be watchful. All of us who have been old in the work before you came, this is a trap we are falling into. That the more active we have become, the more heartless we have become. Christ, we do not have Christ now in our leadership style. From coordinator all through, even to area leader, even to usher. I was talking to Jonathan yesterday. I looked for him before this meeting. So I could talk to him more, but he wasn't around. I think because he's not an area leader. He stopped a wife of an usher from coming to church. I didn't even know about it. Just called that wife and said, that trouble is enough. Don't come to deeper life anymore. And this is Lagos Church. And I'm still here. And the children, you cannot come to church. The husband is an usher. And the husband went to, the, to him and said, uh, my brother, now, I know my wife has a problem. I will not defend my wife. I know she is not born again. And you know, brethren, I've been praying with me that this woman will be born again. Now you say she should not come to church anymore. Okay, let me see pastor. And Jonathan said, I'm sorry for you. You cannot see pastor. What does the man do now? The wife is sent out of the church. Not even by a coordinator. By usher. They cannot come to church. And I didn't know about it. When we send sinners away from church, how are we evangelizing? What are we doing again? So, our activities have been making us to forget Christ. And actually, when I heard about it, I called that usher. Since they won't allow him to see me ordinarily, I had to send for him. And I saw him, I said I heard about your trouble. Then I called the usher himself, Jonathan. I said, tell me about this. Oh, he said, yes. The wife did this and the children did that. We interviewed them and we saw that uh, they were, uh, things were bad. So I told her not to come to church again. I said, Jonathan, I'm still alive as a pastor. How can you send somebody away from the church when I'm still here? Now that's not right. And I apologize to the brother. This brother is having, living with an unbelieving wife, having trouble at home. He comes to church, he has trouble. They want us to kill him. The man will die like that. He is in the house, the wife is not uh, cooperating. And then, in the church too, and he was taught to, the work he was doing, he couldn't do. Because his wife is, you know, the wife is not behaving well, the children are wrong. So he has been stopped his work. And he is just allowed to be coming to church. But he's coming to church. He cannot see pastor. A fatherless child. Where are we leading the church to? And it's not only Jonathan that is guilty. 
I don't know how many people coordinators have sent away from church. How can I know when they will not even allow them to come and see me? I don't know how many people zona leaders have sent away from church. They are bad. I think Judas Iscariot was bad. But Jesus didn't send him away. Let's be very, very careful that we do not just take laws into our hands and oppress the people until the people feel that this is no more a church. The doctrines are there. And I think we have the understanding of the doctrine. But we don't have the heart to believe and to act on the doctrine. Let me ask you. Which of the zonal leaders, let me start with the coordinators. Which of the coordinators now can somebody slap on the right cheek and that coordinator will turn the other cheek? I don't know if you know any of them. I know I've not found one. Which of the zonal leaders now can somebody slap on the one cheek and it will turn the other cheek? Maybe you know them more than I do. I've not found any of them. And if the church is like this, I think we should be praying that Jesus shall come. Before we contaminate these new area leaders, I think they should be taken away to heaven. And let the old heads, the people that are old and incorrigible, before they contaminate the new people, let Christ do something for the new generation. We need to change. We need to call upon the Lord. You see, Solomon was very wise. When we talk about wisdom, Solomon was very, very wise. But after he died, the people came. They said, Rehoboam, you know your father. Very, very wise. But he oppressed us. Now, will you help us and lift up the body? Now you are the son. We will serve you, but lift up the body. Like father, like son. Like coordinator, like zonal leaders. Like zonal leaders, like area leaders. And Rehoboam said, you didn't see anything. My thumb will be thicker than the waist of my father. He whipped you with ordinary waves. I will tie scorpions at the tail end of the waves and beat you with scorpion. That's how they scattered Israel. And right now, that's what is taking place. That the coordinators, my, with all the Bible I know, with all the prayer I prayed, when I saw that I was getting away far, farther and farther from Christ's likeness, and I prayed that, Lord, help me. Even with all that prayer, if I stayed under the leadership of some coordinators, I think I'll need to pray more. That God will help me to be able to keep on through to the end. It's hard. Very hard. I see it. And I know it. And sometimes when people are going, they're leaving the church, they write to me. Last week, I've not seen the person now. The person wrote to me and said, I've tried to see you. I've not been able to see you. The oppression is too much for me. I think I'm leaving. So the person that the fellow told, said, the pastor is your father and the Lord. You are his convert. Whatever is happening, wait for him. Don't live like that. So I sent a message back to the fellow and said, if you want to uh, see me, don't talk about living. If you accept me as pastor and father in the Lord, don't talk about living. If you don't talk about living, I'll look into the matter. But if you talk about living, since you've made up your mind, you are spoiling the case. And eventually, I think the person said, okay, I'll wait for him. But how are we going to continue like this? Those are the people that can write. How about illiterates that cannot write? Like this woman that Jonathan sent away from church, the woman, you know, being an illiterate, could not write any letter, could not do anything, just stayed at home. And I wouldn't have known. But... You have seen that it's not just Solomon. And when we're choosing people, how do we choose people? We choose people, we say, they have wisdom. But the more wisdom they have, the more oppression they bring. Maybe the illiterates will help us better. Those who are not very, very wise. Those who are not clever. Those who are not cunning. 
those who are not be telling the pastor, everything is all right in my district. They cannot make restitution. They cannot make any confession coordinators. Even if they kill people and bury them, they'll just say, well, we're some, we're, uh, sorry, somebody died. How did he die? They won't tell us. Somebody died. Is it our neglect? Somebody died. Is it that when we told the people, don't go to them, don't pray for them, we have sent them to hell. We have sealed their doom. That's how the people died. But they won't tell us how they died. They just say somebody died. We need to talk to the Lord in prayer. That's why we're here this weekend. That we'll see what we have been doing. And if you look at, over here we've written, uh, we've written the uh, responsibilities of zonal leaders. You will not see in any of those responsibilities that zonal leaders, women representatives, area leaders, as fellowship leaders can discipline somebody without reference. Now they put coordinators here. But with all that I'm seeing now, I'm even afraid that we'll make reference only to coordinators. Because those coordinators themselves, God help them to make heaven. Discipline is not in the hand of coordinator. Discipline is not in the hand of zonal leader. The coordinator is just supposed to love, just supposed to care. Not that what you take a whip around and you are whipping them in every zone. Even Jesus Christ didn't do that to his own disciples. He did it once in the temple. Because he had made his father's house a den of thieves and robbers. But not on people that are born again. The people that want to serve the Lord. Who are beating you like that when you are born again and converted. All the time we took you from uh, flat two to Onyibo to Mav, uh, to uh, Moshi uh, and then to Bagada. If we're dealing with you like that, many of you will not remain. Have you been perfect since you came to deeper life? Tell me, have you been perfect? Uh uh. If you have not been perfect since you came, why can't we bear with the imperfections of the people? I believe that Christ's heart is bleeding. I'm not like Christ yet myself. So it's, somebody must preach. Sometimes I'm hard to. Sometimes I'm inconsiderate to. But at least I can confess my own. The problem is with people that do it and they can never confess it. And you know, if I can confess it to you, I'll confess it to God. And somebody who make confessions like I do will not remain the same. The people that remain the same are the people that never make any confession. They say they're okay, but they're not okay. When I'm not okay, I know I'm not okay. And I tell God, and I will tell you when I'm not okay, I'll say, church, I'm not okay. Pray for me. But when you say you are okay, how do we pray for you? When you don't, we are not like Christ, and you say you are like Christ, how do we pray for you? And Jesus said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. You have left your first love. Let's rise up and pray.
Our Father, we bless your name for the way you have spoken to every one of us. We know that you are a God of love. You have shown the love to us over and over. And you are still showing the love to us even now. But Lord, our prayer is that the love you are showing to us, we too will be able to show that same love to other people in Jesus' name. Amen. We have looked at the work as we evaluate, wanting to know diligently the state of the flocks and also the state of the herds. We know that there is a lot still to be done. Apart from numerical growth, we know that the people are dissatisfied spiritually. They have not received all the bread of life they ought to receive. Even the ones they got in the central church. Because of the various problems and the load and the burden and the cares, the discouragement upon them, they cannot enjoy what they receive at the central fellowship. The house fellowship system of the coordinators and zonal leaders and area leaders and house fellowship leaders, which was established to comfort the people, has been a burden on the people. It was established to help the people and to close the back door so that people will not be getting away from the church without our knowledge. By and by, it has been run in the energy of the flesh. It has been done without your love and without your caring. The favoritism and the partiality will run away from in the other denominations. It's come back into a place like this. And the people have seen a lot of cruelty and a lot of oppression. And they do not have a voice to even say out how they are suffering. But Lord, even the people of the world, if they are being oppressed, sometimes they can write in the papers. Sometimes they can make their voice to be heard over the radio over the television but in our own case the oppressed cannot speak out oh lord we know that we came into all this because we allowed the adamic nature to take the preeminence on us we have been saying that we are saved and we have been talking to other people that they are backsliding without knowing that we ourselves have gone away from the Lord. We are forsaking your standard. Now, if anger is something that is common now. Bitterness is now something that is common. Retaliation and revenge is something that takes place every day now. From the top to the bottom. O oh Lord, we pray that leadership and responsibility will not ruin any of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you called Solomon, his father spoke to him. Solomon, love the God of your father. Seek him with your whole heart. Follow him with a perfect heart. And the father told him, if you seek him, you will find him. But if you forsake him, he also will forsake you. And his young heart clung to the word of God, accepted the word of God. And the Lord loved him. Told him, what did he want? He did not ask for the life of his enemies. Neither will he oppress anyone. But he wanted wisdom. So that he could lead and guide this multitude of people that nobody can number. And the Lord gave him the wisdom on the basis of caring for the people. 
But eventually, after his death, the complaint of the people is that he used that gift of wisdom to oppress them. O oh Lord, we are no different. And all that we're doing today is we're coming before you. Not as people that have done well, but as people that have gone astray. Lord, the major thing is not even now just making the church to grow in number, but that we even have favor with you. That the peace which is no more in our heart, the love which is no more in our nature, and the qualities of grace which we have lost, that will restore unto us in Jesus' name. Lord, even our families, they are suffering as a result of our position in the church. Now we can talk as husbands so cruelly, so authoritatively. We're not talking as husbands anymore. We talk as coordinator. We talk as zonal leader, even in the home. And the people that we go to see, our own colleagues who came to the church at the same time, but just by grace, not by being totally qualified. Because, Lord, none of us is qualified. If you will mark our iniquities, our shortcomings, our weaknesses, none of us will remain, even to be a worker. But just because you have chosen us by grace, we have so exalted ourselves over the people. We we'll want them to recognize us by force. And if they don't, must drive them out of the church. But Lord, we are praying that all the law and the Christ-likeness that we have lost, the tenderness, the compassion, the lowly spirit, the child-likeness that we have lost, that Lord, you restore everything to us in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll go back for our families and become real husbands. And Lord, in the zone, without grabbing for position, without trying to assert authority, just like you did in the midst of your own disciples and you loved them unto the very end, we pray that that same love You'll plant in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we go back to the people, Lord, give us the humility Amen. to accept where we are wrong. Amen. And to know that we are not carrying title beyond this city. Even these titles are meaningless to other Christians in this same city. They are meaningless to heaven. And Lord, help us not to carry all these titles on the head and begin to oppress people. Give us the heart of Christ. Yeah. Give us the nature of Christ. Yeah. You told us, He that will be the chief among you, the greatest among you, let him be your servant. And Lord, we are sorry that we have lost that servant attitude that will restore unto us the servant attitude once again in Jesus name Amen. we pray that over this weekend you'll help us to look inward to see where we are falling and not to make any excuses for our fall but to come before you as people that want transformation, as people that need the mind of Christ, and fully and totally and wholeheartedly give ourselves to you. Oh Lord, change us. Without changing us, we cannot change people around us. No matter how long we shout, 
no matter how many people will drive away, no matter how many people will discipline, no matter how many people will deprive of their rights, no matter what we do to people, the work will not succeed if we do not have a change. And Lord, if we give excuse for our failure and for our fall, you'll never give us grace. Because you give grace to the humble. Therefore, Lord, we pray that every one of us will go before you and accept where we are falling so that you'll raise us up. Amen. And we pray, Lord, as many of us as are backsliding into anger and bitterness and oppression and dealing with the people as if we're dealing with machines and lifeless matter, the people that you brought with your own precious blood. As many of us as have backslidden and gone far from Christ and have lost Christ's likeness. O oh Lord, restore us in Jesus' name. Amen. We do not want to wait till the last day when you will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that walk in iniquity. Neither do we, Lord, want to behave like Judas Iscariot, who even after you have said that one of you will betray me, and you gave him the sword, and he even said, is it I, Lord? And you said, yes, you are. That he still went out, and he was lost. Father, it will be unfortunate if the church has made a grievous mistake in putting somebody as a coordinator and it is that position that makes him to go to hell. If the church has made somebody a zonal leader or area leader or usher or choir leader or anyone or myself, when you called me, you didn't tell me I'll be a pastor. You just called me to become born again so I can make heaven. And Lord, you have favored me. But I, do not, I didn't know how to preach. I didn't have boldness. I couldn't talk to anybody. Couldn't even give testimony anywhere. And what I didn't qualify for, you gave me. And if now my pastoral leadership ability or position or title or gains to my head, and ruin me. The same thing, Lord, for my brothers and sisters. If what we did not qualify for, which you gave us, just by your grace, if that is the thing now that will so get within us and lead us to hell and be forever lost, it will be unfortunate. Lord, we are praying that will make us to know where we are falling. And every one of us will clinch to Jesus Christ. Amen. That Lord, position may go. Titles may go. But heaven will remain. Lord, we are not grabbing at anything. All we say is that thy will be done. Lord, what if I'm not a pastor? Heaven is more precious. What if somebody is not a coordinator? Somebody is not a sonar leader. And what? So what? Lord, heaven is greater. Because in eternity, all that will matter is that we remain with Christ. We pray that nothing will take intimacy with God, intimacy with Christ, for many of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, even Ahab, as wicked as he was, when you sent Elijah to him, and you told him about his oppression of Nebuchadnezzar, he began to walk softly before you. Lord, will Ahab be greater than we are? The most sensitive to your call than we are. Help us, Lord. 
We're still young. We shouldn't have such a hard heart that even the Spirit of God cannot penetrate. And Lord, I pray, if it's my example and my leadership style that has made the people to also oppress the people, maybe they are following me. Lord, whatever in me, whatever it is they see in me, which spoils them, which destroys them, which makes them not to be the people they ought to be. Maybe they are just a reflection of who I am. I pray whatever change you need to make in me, so that these people will not be ruined, thinking they are following me, thinking they are copying me, that will make all the changes in me and in them in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we want to make heaven. Even if the church does not grow beyond this number, if this is all we can do, if we do not have the ability, if you have seen that if you give us more, that pride will ruin us. Oh Lord, we want heaven, not just the number. And Father, we are praying that anything that will take heaven away from us, remove all those things from our lives in Jesus' name. We preach sanctification for these many years. And Lord, if we preach it and we cannot experience it, how better are we than the Pharisees? Therefore, Lord, we are praying that once again, you start from me and with everybody here tonight, apply your surgical spiritual knife. And the hardness in us the oppressing attitude and nature in us, the Adamic nature in us. Lord, don't spare any of us, all of us, all together. Take everything out in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, the people are waiting. Back home, they don't know what we're doing here. Some of them are waiting now in the districts and in the zones. Maybe they are thinking, those people have gone for their conference again. They will give them more weeks, more methods on how to come back and make life difficult for us. Lord, they don't think we can ever change now. They think that the more we have conferences, the more we teach ourselves on how to kill them. But Father, Jesus was not like that. We don't want to be like that. It's the enemy that has come to plant this in our nature. It's Satan that has come to pollute our garden. Lord, you know many years ago, we really loved you. And we still want to love you. Therefore, Lord, we pray that the fears in the hearts of the people you will erase all those fears from them in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, they don't believe we can die for them now. But you can change us. That if need be, we can die for them. They don't believe that we love them. They don't believe we are caring for them. They just believe that they are instruments to be used for programs. They don't believe they're important to us. And they don't think we'll ever change. And some of them are wondering, now once somebody becomes a coordinator, can they even discipline them? Can they give them a chance to pray and make cry their lives? Or is it that we're unfortunate? That man is there, is there for life. But Lord, all that they are fearing, drive away their fears. Change us ourselves. Amen. Let us be the people of God that we ought to be. Amen. And Lord, all the hypocrisy and all the pretense, hiding behind the ability to talk, hiding behind natural wisdom, take all that from us in Jesus' name. Amen. 
and the attitude of wanting the people to become like slaves, to serve us, to run errands for us, to die for us. Help us, Lord, to change. Amen. Lord, what have we got? Any little thing we have, we want to serve you. And the only way we can serve you is to serve the people. And Father, we are praying, you'll help us to serve more. Amen. Give us a servant attitude. Amen. Give us a loving attitude. Amen. Help us to be the people we ought to be. Amen. Lord, whatever is not Christ-like within us, take everything away. Amen. Lord, tonight, we cannot point a kissing finger to anybody. We're all guilty. And all we're saying is not that we are better than anybody. All we're saying is that, Lord, we just want to change. And that you'll change every one of us. Amen. That even the people we have in the church now, they will feel the love. They will feel the care. Amen. And every evil thing that we have done, help us, not in carnality, not in human wisdom, not trying to say, well, okay, you can come back now. Well, we need to repent and restitute. Help us to do it like children of God. Amen. So that, Lord, the change you have made in us, you'll make it in the people as well. Amen. And this church will flow together in love. So that nobody will feel cheated. Nobody will feel oppressed. Nobody will feel that they are throwing him away. But everybody will feel that there is a place for them. Lord, as we correct all these things in our lives, we pray that you use us. We want to be useful in your kingdom. Lord, you know, even with all the mistakes we have made, as we surrender ourselves to you, there's nothing you cannot do. And therefore we pray that since your love is greater than our love, you are not going to do like we have done. You are not going to throw us away like we threw other people away. Lord, let us experience your love more and more. Amen. Let us feel the touch of your hand more and more. Amen. Help us not to be prayerful. Amen. That even when there are difficulties, even when the heat of the activities, even when the heat is very hot, and in the past we would have been impatient, in the past we would have spoken aggressively, in the past we would have got angry, but Lord, now, make such a change within us that it becomes impossible to get angry. It becomes impossible to defend ourselves. It becomes impossible to oppress the people. Help us to share the joy that we experience. Amen. The love that we receive from you, help us to share with other people as well. Amen. And we pray that at the end of the day, the most important thing will not be the title we hold, it will be the Christ-likeness we have. Amen. 